like to focus on today is why is identity important and why is it important that we scrutinise the different approaches to digital identity that are going to be available to us and to those in developing countries. Um, we are, we've set up as a B Corporation and have also gone through and are working with the Compass Response for Innovation um, team across Europe that's working with cybersecurity and nanotech companies. And B Corps, if you haven't come across them, are an interesting global movement that basically asks companies to look not just at the bottom line, but to look at how you scale profits and purpose. So how you look at the well-being of your staff, you look at the supply chain, you look at your customers, you look at the planet, you look at them all in the round. So that at no one time should you just focus on shareholder value. And I think we're probably one of the first companies in the identity tech space that has brought this lens to identity. Um, and we're trying to invite in as much external scrutiny on this journey. We're a relatively new company, um, but we're hoping that this approach starts to move the dial and move the needle in terms of how digital identity are looked at. So where might you come across identity in everyday life? Now, when I started working in this area a few years ago, I could never have thought of all the different areas. So the word passport is, is the one that you might think of with identity. Um, a passport came from the actual origin of passing the port, and way, way back to about 400 BC are the first mentions of when documents of a permission to travel were given by a leader for a citizen to move to another country or to travel and to basically request safe permits of a person. But it wasn't until the 1800s that passports started to be issued, and it wasn't actually until the 1950s, um, after the war, when people actually started to have much more sophisticated passport documents. When people think about identity, they may also think in today's world of our whole of our digital footprint and that side of identity. They might not automatically think of the passport document. But one of the huge problems that we have in today's world is that 1.5 or so billion people that have no official identity document. And because of that, they can't prove who they are to vote or to access medical services or even set up a bank account. So a lot of the work in digital identity has to span what are the needs and requirements of people in the developed world who are dealing with fraud um, and having very complex interactions where you need to trust who you're dealing with online versus in developing countries where people haven't got the basic rights and actually without a foundational document you have to look at what are the proxies they can put in place to even start to have an identity. And what we're trying to do is look at both um, sides of that equation. But if you look in our everyday life, um, today's world, if you go to a nightclub, you might be asked to put your entire document on a flatbed scanner and then all of your details are taken when actually all they really need to know is you're over 18. Um, it could be, for instance, on, let me think of another one, in an online dating site. Um, today's world, you might not know actually who, who you're dating, but something a digital identity could offer would be anonymity, but just the fact you're over 18. Or anonymity, the fact you're over 18, and maybe your gender. And these use cases are starting to develop with digital identity. Um, other areas are around medical. Um, it could be that you want to check at a recruitment centre to a hospital that it's the same person that passes the interview that then does arrive with the white coat and the stethoscope two weeks later to start working as a locum. You might then want to know which of the physical areas in a hospital that, that person can go to. Are they allowed in the maternity ward? Are they allowed in the personnel records or in the medical area where drugs are dispensed? And the permissioning based on who you are, what qualifications you have, what vetting you've gone through, is more and more important in, in our world. So, for example, in recruitment screening, businesses are wanting to know ahead of time, have you got the right to work in a certain area and can they trust your qualifications? In a supermarket, they might need to know that you're over 12 or 15 or 18 to buy a good. So in all of these different areas, there's an element of either an age verification or an identity verification that is really, really important. Um, this one, I think, sets my mind um, reeling around connections. So 
when we were talking about um, the overload earlier on, it could be that as a, as a parent, you might need 10 different people to pick up your child at a nursery. If you've got an aging parent, you might want to allow a few people to be able to pick them up at a care home. Um, and as you're approaching your later years, you might want to think, who are the people that can take charge of your digital assets or your physical assets? How do you let them interact with the utility company? My mum is 86 and finds it a real pain in the neck trying to deal with the gas and the electric and the telephone, but I can't act on her behalf because I'm not the registered owner of the account. So this idea of permissioning is also something with digital identity that's important, but then looking at unintended consequences, you have to think, what is the audit chain that if I were a bad actor trying to defraud an elderly parent that, that keeps a track of what I'm actually doing? So there's a, a lot of different angles around digital identity that we need to get right. This is just a quick view of the big impact and why lots of governments are looking at this as the fraud perspective. So over half of um, fraud is basically linked to identity theft, um, which is often down to a root document being lost. Mi One million driving licenses had to replace last year just in the UK, 400,000 passports. So that's 1.4 million people just in the UK at risk of identity theft, through mainly in the nighttime economy and mainly a younger generation losing that precious document. Yet we don't let people at the moment take a digital version, so they're wandering around with them in the back pocket. Um, so the risk of fraud is huge, but then you have to get it right how this actually happens. So if we're looking at people proving who they are or how they are online, and I think the lady that did the oral poetry session earlier brought out lots of these threads. Um, if you're looking at proving that you're over 18, for instance, to access an adult site, how can you do that in a way that is private, that lets you just share the fact that you're over 18 and is something that's private to you and that cannot then be sold on or used to humiliate you? How could it be that someone that's under 18 could share just the fact they're under 18 and allow to have an image taken down and the right to be forgotten um, by just sharing in a proportionate way the fact that they're under 18? So these technologies are possible, but you need to ensure that that's done in the right way. Um, when we started to look at this area four years ago, most of the companies in this space were only operating in a business-to-business -business fashion. So we're typically credit reference agencies like Equifax or Experian, and they didn't really ever interact directly with the consumer. So the check would be done to you. You're looking for a loan, they see if you've had a loan before, they look at a database, yes, this person paid on time, tick. But if you're what's called thing file and didn't have a credit history, then they would scratch their heads and you could have a very manual process or not be offered that. We need to have a poor credit rating. Um, this approach now with digital identity is flipping things on its head and saying that you, the consumer, should be at the center. You should have rights. You should be able to have access to things, qualifications that you've earned. If you've paid for a mobile phone bill, that company ought to give you something that you can prove to another organisation that you have existed and you have paid on time. You shouldn't have to be taking around utility bills with you, um, printed out on paper to prove that you've paid your council tax. Um, you shouldn't have to be getting physical copies of your degrees and trotting around with them to your next employer. But we need to verify that they're true and they're not falsified. And, and this is the dilemma. Um, Looking at tracking and surveillance is really, really hard as well. Um, at my company, we've been trying to see how can we do customer support, but not track you as an individual? How can we let you know that there's a problem um, with, say for instance, we send a one-time pin to your device, but that if that is down because the service in Brazil isn't working, can we still support those Brazilian consumers if we have no way of, of knowing who they are? Um, so we've built our systems that we can't know who people are after an initial seven day window and then that creates problems for us. But one of the things that identity companies have to look at is do they want any tracking of the consumers they're inter interacting with? If you want to build trust and you want to show there's not a mass surveillance, on the flip side you're having to market and acquire consumers and serve, serve them and give them good support but without tracking and knowing who they are. And that is actually quite a technical challenge. 
consumer redress is something that's also very new in this area. Um, so we've gone out and met with Consumers International, which Consumer Reports, all of those bodies that traditionally, if you've had a toaster that's gone wrong, or a dishwasher or a washing machine, they've done great reports on what the landscape for the best toaster is. But they've not really got round to looking at what are the forms of digital age verification? What are the forms of digital identity? If you're going to, later in this year in the UK, it will be mandatory for all adults that want to access adult content to age verify, but there's no report you can go to today to say this is what you ought to be looking for to ensure that your data will be looked after properly. One of the things we've also looked at is criminal misuse. So if somebody sets up a digital identity with us, we only have a seven day window to be really sure that's the right person. After that, we don't know who they are and what they're doing. But if we were to find, for example, working with an online dating site that someone had repeatedly used as their modus operandi, our digital identity, to meet someone, so they know I'm over 50 and my name is Julie, but then I'm a bad actor and I injure somebody. What we had to think of in our terms and conditions is do we still let Julie access that platform and prove to someone else if repeatedly, as their modus operandi, they're using our system to gain trust. Yet on the other hand, speaking with victim support and unlock um, the charities that look at the rights of the individual, um, is it proportionate? So they might be using their digital identity to log into their bank account. They might be using it to manage their passwords. So even if they committed hideous crimes, they should still have a bank account. They should still be able to log into their systems. So we're having to look at what are the range of things that you can do with your digital identity and where we think that there's, specific, there's not a crime at the moment of repeatedly using your digital identity to create you know, grievous bodily harm. So what we're doing is something that the judicial system hasn't caught up with. And we know also that it, we think that it's proportionate that somebody should still be able to access a bank account. So we would have to look at in all the countries where we operate, could you trust the police force that is reporting that someone's repeatedly you know, murdering people in the local Airbnb um, and using Yoti to sign up and get guests and, and prove that they're trustworthy but actually be untrustworthy? If that was the case, we've had to set up a set of conditions which have to be proportionate, can't look at somebody differently through gender or age or religion, but say this is the line. If you're repeatedly misusing the system of and, and um, misusing the trust of the system, that would be grounds in our terms to not use that part of the platform. We'd still let you log in biometrically. And these are things that people haven't looked at before because the digital identity system hasn't been consumer focused, it's only been business to business. So looking at response and innovation is another one. Our system, as well as working in the developed world, in developing countries could also be used to let somebody prove who they are. Um, maybe without a smartphone, maybe without a document. But then, could it be misused by local governments? Um, this is the thing we were actually doing field trials at the moment in Kenya and Cambodia, looking at how our digital identity can be used on the ground and let people, maybe um, young people going into a school situation or teachers teaching, prove to the NGO they're working for that they're receiving education or they're giving education. Um, and what we want to look at is, and by doing it in the wild, see is that something that would work or are there other consequences around us doing that that haven't been anticipated. Um, these are, it's breaking ground that hasn't been done before. And, um, we set up, as a result of that, a Guardian's Council, I look along here, that basically meets every quarter and looks at our approach to how we're going about this. So Renata Avila is a human rights lawyer from Latin America, works with the Web We Want Foundation, and Doc Sell is a, is a consumer champion. Um, we've also until recently had a, um, somebody looking at the last mile tech and accessibility, um, or first mile tech, and we have another seat on that side. And we're looking at more people from Asia and India with tech security um, and children's rights experience. To help us, it leads the principles that we've, we've set up around data security, around keeping the community safe, and things like data minimization as well. The bottom line, I think, for people sat in this audience is looking at when you see digital identities coming along, what is the the scale on which you can judge them. So some of it will be quite technical and looking at what is the encryption behind it. But could that organization sell your data? 
Could they mine your data? Or has it been set up in such a way that only you can access your data? And that is, I think, will be a really strong question to ask. And what sort of external oversight or um, review bodies are actually looking at how it operates? Because no one undated at the moment. And it could be that you're using digital identity to sign documents. It could be that it's just logging in and out of websites and not filling in um, long forms. So it could be in ways that happen by stealth that you don't necessarily think. But gradually over time, you're building a digital identity profile, maybe with several different companies. Definitely Apple's going to offer one, probably LinkedIn, uh, probably all of the big players will be offering digital identities in the next period. Facebook at some point potentially as well. But looking underneath it and looking at some of those questions way back at the beginning as to how are they actually building it and what are the factors that would, could you take your identity away from that platform and easily move it to another? The GDPR you ought to, but the very first test cases there are still being put together. So if you look at some of the Schrems cases that have just been filed in Ireland, you'll see they're starting to say it's too much of a Russian roulette, either you accept these terms or you don't. And that is going to be contested. But for digital identity, um, this is probably the first time in this next year where in the UK a vast percentage of the population will be offered a digital identity for age initially. But once it's there for age, it can be used in lots of different contexts and it's up to you then to understand Yeah, to understand when you're using it in all those other contexts, the importance behind it of that scrutiny. So there will be consumer boards that will be being set up. Hopefully, there's an ethics and transparency committee around AI that's going to be set up in London. Um, and I think through the Biometrics Institute as well, you will see more work in this area. But it's, I was very delighted today to be invited because I think this is a really important time over the next year, post GDPR, with the advent of even more use of biometrics. Um, and yours is the generation that will be able to look at some of these oversight mechanisms and should, should be questioning and probing how organisations like mine are going about this. Thank you.